this is uh, uh, 16 p.m. of uh, European time. And let me open this uh, plenary session. Uh, um, my name is Vlad Shalaev. I'm from Purdue University. And it's a pleasure to be in this uh, one of the uh, most important conference in the field of uh, metamaterials. And uh, thank you, Said, and thank you all uh, the organizers for putting together this conference in these very difficult times. So in these plenary sessions, we have two presentations. And the first one comes from uh, Deidre O'Carroll from Rutgers University. So her research area include uh, nanophotonics, plasmonics, organic uh, optoelectronics, and energy materials. She is a recipient of uh, National Science Foundation Career Award and American Chemical Society and Investigator Award uh, in Polymer uh, Material Science. And uh, she also got uh, uh, Future Research Leaders Award from uh, Science Foundation of Ireland. So uh, Deidre's lecture is actually pre-recorded, but she's available to answer questions right after the lecture. And also you could send your questions through the chat so that if there would not be enough time, she would be able to uh, answer your questions later on. So with this, let me just uh, switch on the, uh, the video. And uh, so we're all looking forward for uh, this lecture. Good afternoon. In this presentation, I will discuss the use of metasurfaces for light management and semiconductor thin films. Uh, I will introduce some of our work on recent work on integrating metasurfaces with organic semiconductors and while they have a myriad of device applications what's more interesting i think is actually the fundamental interactions that we've discovered and learned about as we've studied these materials in this talk i will begin by describing some of the emerging uses of metasurfaces in thin film optoelectronic devices then I'll present two case studies from our research lab, one that studies the impact of polymer morphology on emission enhancement by porous metasurfaces, and a second one that studies plasmonic metasurface near fields for light emission stabilization and rate enhancement from blue light emitting phosphors. And finally, I'll end with a brief summary and outlook. Here I'm showing some examples of applications of metasurfaces in thin film semiconductor optoelectronics uh, from a few years ago. These were some of the earliest examples presented in the literature. Metasurfaces in general are suitable for light management in semiconductor thin films because they're extremely thin, as well as large area in uh, two dimensions uh, in the plane of the device. They also are attractive because of their ability to localize the electric field of light at their surface, and this can create a lot of near field effects that can couple with the excitons or the emission transitions of the material. In 2017, Park et al. showed that quantum dot LEDs can be integrated with metasurfaces, and it was used essentially for steering, beam steering uh, of the light from the LED. Absorption enhancement in silicon solar cells, thin film silicon solar cells, was also demonstrated by Shamali et al. in 2018, and this was where they integrated a metasurface at the backside of a silicon, amorphous silicon solar cell. Emani et al. also have shown uh, that gallium nitride can actually be etched into a metasurface, so this is where we're actually using the active semiconductor itself and integrating metasurface structures into them. And this again can be used to affect the emission properties of the semiconductor. Light steering has also been demonstrated in OLEDs using metasurfaces by Zhu et al. in 2016, and they show that they can uh, alter the direction of the emission of light by applying metasurfaces to OLEDs. So these are some of the examples of how metasurfaces can be used for optoelectronics. And in the next part of this talk, I want to talk about some of the more fundamental interactions between semiconductors and metasurfaces. In a more recent paper, we looked a little bit more closely at how metal metasurfaces, porous metal metasurfaces can affect 
conjugate of polymer emission. And in general, when you think of light emission from materials, semiconductors, in, in particular for fluorescence in this case, typically within five nanometers, you expect metal induced quenching. And this is caused by either charge transfer, dipole dipole coupling, or interband electronic absorption by the metal coupling with the excitons and the semiconductor. Further out, though, you do experience metal enhanced fluorescence that's caused by surface plasmon resonances, scattering, or photonic modes. What we found when we integrated metasurfaces with fluorescent conjugated polymer semiconductors that in addition to the regular absorption and emission transitions from singlet excitons in the semiconductor, we would get uh, a portion of the fluorescence, or the, sorry, the transition from the S1 stage, sing, first excited singlet state, going to either dark modes, so in other words, it, was, it would be quenched, or they would couple to various photonic or plasmonic modes, or uh, loss mechanisms of the metasurface. And the main ones we identified were either coupling to guided photonic modes. In general, this would cause an increase in the radiative rate and or coupling to surface plasma and polarotons. And this also would tend to improve the radiative rate. Also, we could get coupling to lossy surface waves or ohmic losses, in other words, absorption in the met metal and this would increase the non-radiative rate. Finally, if we structured the metal uh, as we would with making nanopores or particles on the metal surface, we can increase the radiative rate uh, through localized surface plasma resonances in interacting with the excitons. So there are uh, many different pathways for excited excitons in materials to decay uh, besides the regular transition when there are coupled to metasurfaces. In this particular study, we were interested in understanding the role of the semiconducting polymer morphology on the fluorescence enhancement. So we studied three different polymers, each with very similar wavelength emission, but different actual film morphologies. So typically regiorandum B3HD has a very amorphous polymer chain orientation in the film. It's been coded film. MEHPPV is more ordered, but also has some amorphous regions. And regular regular P3HT is very crystalline, typically with the main chain of the polymer lying in the plane of the semiconductor. And so in general, you can see that the excitons, if just based on this, if you have amorphous polymer chains that can be oriented in different directions, if you have crystallinity, you can get very strong orientation in the plane, in the case of regular regular P3HT, but you can also get interactions, interchain interactions that cause interchain excitons. Um, we studied the impact of porous silver metasurfaces surface, sur with different pore sizes and pore densities on the, the fluorescence from these polymers. One of the pores, these were made using a de-wetting de process and they were over a large area. So typically a few centimeters squared because ultimately we wanted to integrate these into devices. You can see the pore diameter uh, for the small nanopore silver was 0.12 microns with a pore density of 2.5 by 10 to the seven. And for the larger pores, uh, larger nanopore silver, it was 1.3 microns with a slightly lower pore density. We studied the impact of these polymer, uh, these metasurfaces on the polymer fluorescence, first using a fairly low numerical aperture microscope objective. So we're only collecting a fairly narrow emission cone, mostly the out of plane emission from this sample where the polymer coated the metasurface and it was encapsulated on either side. You can see that the regiorandum P3HT spectrum is strongly enhanced. So this is the enhancement in the photoluminescence spectrum of the metasurface compared to planar silver. You can see it's strongly enhanced for the regiorandum P3HT. However, for the MEHPPV and the regular P3HT, it's not as enhanced, even though it is enhanced uh, reasonably well compared to planar silver. This was for the 
a small pore sample. Um, however, for the large pore sample, you can see that the overall enhancement was less. And in general, then the smaller pores tended to enhance the emission the greatest due to more intense localized surface plasma resonances. The EPL, so this enhancement in the photoluminescence, is caused essentially by either an enhancement in the excitation rate, an enhancement in the quantum efficiency of the material, or an enhancement in the collection uh, direction. To remove the directional dependence of the potential emission enhancement, we studied the quantum efficiency modifications by inserting our samples into an integrating sphere. So here we remove any directional dependence of our measurements and actually determine if there's a quantum efficiency enhancement caused by the metasurface on the polymer. If you look at the quantum efficiencies of the polymers on different surfaces, but first let's look at the literature values for regiorandum P3HT, typically it's around 10%. MEHPPV is about the same or slightly higher. Regioregular P3HT, it's a more crystalline polymer, tends to have more interchain interactions, so the quantum efficiency is lower. And so on glass, what we found that in general, the quantum efficiency in our own measurements, so these are all our measurements, uh, in, this is just compared to literature values, we found actually quite a high quantum yield of 19.4%. MEHPPV was a bit higher, but almost the same. And regioregular P3HT was about 8%. On planar silver, this dropped for the two more amorphous polymers, and it stayed about the same for regioregular P3HT. Uh, for the two porous metasurfaces, the large and the small pore surfaces, we found that in general we were able to recover some of the uh, the emission that was quenched by the planar silver uh, up to about 17%, almost the same as glass for the large nanopore silver. For This was the same as well for the MEHPPV. And also interestingly for the regular P3HT, we didn't see a strong effect or change in the quantum efficiency uh, on those two porous metasurfaces. So in general, we found that the planar silver quenched the quantum efficiency of the regiorandum P3HT the most and the regioregular P3HT the least. The nanopore silver does recover some of the quantum efficiency lost by placing the emitter on a metal. And the enhancement in the quantum efficiency is largest for regiorandum P3HT, the more, most amorphous polymer. And it's also higher for the larger nanopore silver than the smaller nanopore silver. In addition to the quantum efficiency enhancement, we also looked at the contributions to the photoluminescence enhancement from excitation enhancement and improvements in the collection of the emission to our detection system. Um, so here is a quite a busy plot, but here is plotted excitation enhancement versus the transmission of the uh, transmission of enhancement of the bare metasurface compared to planar silver. Overall, the main message of this plot is a little bit difficult to judge, but you can see very obviously, at least for the regiorandum P3HD, that there is a strong excitation enhancement, uh, whereas for the other two polymers, the MEHPPV and, and the regioregular P3HD, there is not much of an excitation enhancement. So we attribute the large enhancement of the excitation to a smaller extinction coefficient of red and the P3HT compared to the other two polymers. So there's more ability for it to be improved or enhanced by the metasurface due to increased absorption enhancement. And then a greater fraction of out-of-plane optical transition dipoles, and they will couple better to the out-of-plane polarized uh, local electric fields of the pores. The conjugated polymers on pores and silver regions of the nanopore silver interestingly showed very similar excitation enhancement for the regiorandum P3HT. And in general, we found no clear dependence of the excitation enhancement on pore size. The third contributor to the photoluminescence enhancement was changes in the emission pattern of the luminescence that were affected by the pores and that resulted in 
a difference in collection efficiency of our system. So taking a look here at uh, just the expression for the collection enhancement written as a function of the photoluminescence enhancement divided by the excitation enhancement times the quantum efficiency enhancement, we can see that basically that there are differences between the emission enhancement and the quantum efficiency enhancement, and that indicates that there must be emission pattern modifications as well. And we carried out some electromagnetic simulations to dig into this aspect further. And we found, for the most part, uh, with the planar silver, it would direct the emission all to one side, to the polymer side. For the glass, it would leak both into the polymer and into the glass substrate. Um, and then for the me porous metal surfaces, the emission would be very unpredictable, depending on pore size and would often leak uh, prefer preferentially into the polymer more than into uh, the glass, except for certain positions of the dipole if you put them um, very close to the glass in the center of the pore. This is a summary of the findings of this study. And as we went over, there are three contributions to the photoluminescence enhancement. There's the excitation modification that's caused by localized surface plasma and resonances of the pore of the pores at the excitation wavelength. So they're essentially enhancing absorption of the incident light into the semiconductor. The emission direction modification also occurs. You can see, for example, compared to glass, the planar system, the planar silver will typically create less emission coupling to the substrates. However, with the nanopore silver, you'll tend to get more emission in the substrates, um, as well as quite a lot of emission directed normal to the plane of the substrate as well due to the light scattering. And finally, we also found emission rate or quantum efficiency modifications that were due to uh, the Purcell effect, which essentially were coupling the emission dipole to the resonance of the pore, and that's creating a change in the transition rate and boosting efficiency in certain cases. Overall, we found that the emission from the polymers with more amorphous chain morphology is enhanced the most by the nanopore silver metasurfaces compared to the planar silver surfaces. And this is attributed to larger excitation enhancement associated with the out-of-plane polarized electric fields in the pores and also the out-of-plane chain morphology of the amorphous polymers, as well as a larger quantum efficiency enhancement associated with outcoupled uh, surface plasma polaritons that are coupled better by the out-of-plane dipoles. So the final example from our lab on how metasurfaces can be used for light management in pin film semiconductors is focused on using the metasurfaces for stabilizing the emission of blue light emitting phosphors. To give some background and context, uh, organic light emitting devices or OLEDs are currently being used in handheld displays. For example, the iPhone 10 has been using OLEDs as well as many Samsung devices have been using them for years. You also have LG, which has, have come out with OLED TVs. Um, there are also emerging applications of these devices for indicator lights in uh, the automotive industry, as well as flexible displays and touch screens for laptops. They're also being investigated for general lighting, although these haven't uh, reached the market yet. And some of the benefits of OLEDs is that they can be produced at low temperatures, so there's low energy requirements. Uh, they have earth abundant constituent elements and they can, their color can be tuned synthetically by changing the molecular structure. Uh, some of the drawbacks is that currently they're very expensive because of uh, there hasn't been economies of scale. In other words, the, the companies haven't gone to large scale production of these devices yet, which would drive down the cost. 
and as well the biggest issue technically is the blue emitter performance both in terms of its emission efficiency and its stability the causes of the instabilities of blue organic light emitting phosphors that go into the blue component of the OLED is they're mainly caused by an imbalanced balanced total electron current, triplet triplet exciton annihilation, and triplet polaron annihilation. And many researchers have looked at ways to solve these issues. Some methods that have been developed are double emission layers, uh, grading the emissive dopant. Um, alternative high mobility electron transport layers, as well as use of emitters with short exciton lifetimes. Triplet triplet annihilation is essentially, essentially occurs when the triplet excitons, which are excited by applying uh, electricity to the OLED, they're, they have a long excited state and uh, when they hang around for a long time, especially at high applied powers to the device, so you can build up many triplets in the material and rather than decaying radiatively, they will annihilate each other and create degradation to the molecular structure of the emitter. Triplet polaron, polaron annihilation can also occur at high triplet exciton densities when triplets interact with charged polarons in the device. In general, triplet triplet annihilation is proportional to the triplet exciton density squared because you need two triplets for this process to occur and triplet polaron annihilation is proportional to the triplet exciton density. So if you want to minimize these two effects, you need to try and enable the triplets to decay as quickly as possible so they can't hang they don't have enough time to hang around and annihilate each other before emitting a photon. Uh, if you look for example here at the stability which is defined as the time it takes for the initial OLED intensity to drop to 50%. The, for red and green emitting OLEDs, the phosphorescent type, they've greater than 900,000 hours, so excellent stability. And that's even better than the fluorescent OLEDs. However, for the blue, as well as light blue and true blue OLEDs, for the phosphorescence, they only, for the phosphorescent case, they only have stabilities of 20,000 hours. And for true blue, that drops down to 5,000 hours, so extremely poor performance. And it's actually worse than that of the fluorescent OLEDs as well. So oftentimes in some of the commercial devices, they will use a fluorescent, a lower efficiency fluorescent emitter for the blue component rather than the higher efficiency, um, but less stable phosphorescent emitter. So in general, then, since the triplet exciton density is proportional to the exciton lifetime, one approach to addressing the efficiency issue is to accelerate the radiative decay rate of the triplet excitons in the phosphorescent material. Our approach to addressing the instability of blue organic phosphors is centered around the use of localized electromagnetic fields of metasurfaces and using them to shorten the phosphorescence decay rate extrins extrinsically by modifying the local density of optical states. And in doing so, that should drive down the pro probability of triplet triplet and triplet polaron annihilation. And this idea is, is comes from Fermi's golden rule, which states that the spontaneous emission rate of emission from uh, a, a light source is proportional to the transition dipole moment of the material that's emitting light. That's an intrinsic factor to the material, as well as an extrinsic, extrinsic factor, which is the density of optical states. So for the most part, people will modify the transition dipole moment of the material by changing its molecular structure. But in our case, we're focusing on tuning this extrinsic factor, the density of optical states using the metasurfaces. And this is uh, built upon a fairly well-known idea, at least in the plasmonics community, where you can accelerate or increase the rate of spontaneous emission by coupling a light emitting material to a plasmonic nanostructure or metal nanoparticle. For example, this is some past work I did uh, about 10 years ago where uh, compared to the film and the nanowire case, when you couple polythiophene emitter to a metal rod, the, the photoluminescence lifetime drop uh, decreases significantly. So the spontaneous emission rate increases. And even if you insert it into a nanoscale antenna, it can really shorten the lifetime. And this is due to the Purcell effect 
caused by the local electric field enhancement of the uh, metal nanoparticle. So we're transferring this idea to the metasurface. We can get these local hotspots or local electric field enhancements in nano uh, particle based metasurfaces. They're also nice in that they can be readily integrated into a device because they're uh, planar. Uh, they have, uh, they're extended in two dimensions, uh, whereas they're very thin in third dimension. So they're very useful for thin film mapped electronics. And you can see here from a simulated electromagnetic field profile, you can get very intense electric fields between the particles when they're the right size and interparticle spacing um, is chosen for the metasurface. Uh, we've been making these nanoparticle metasurfaces using a thermally assisted de-wetting method and we can control the size to some extent. Um, overall the periodicity is, is not really there, it's, these are aperiodic, but that's fine for this uh, application. We, we are only concerned with short range interactions between the emitters and the nanoparticles of the metasurface. For this study we chose a very well-known blue emitting organometallic phosphor, FIRPIC, as well as the conjugated polymer host that's used to deliver the charge to the emitter emitting phosphor. And we chose three different metasurface morphologies, the nanoparticle case, the nanoporous metasurface, and the one dimensional uh, silver grating with two different periods. Shown here is a plot of normalized photoluminescence intensity versus time for the light emitting phosphor on different surfaces. Compared to planar silver, the gratings do quite well, uh, as well as the nanoparticle silver clearly improves the stability the most. The nanopore silver uh, doesn't really change the stability at all. We did many of these uh, stability measurements and took statistical averages and standard deviations of the data that's shown here. And you can see that this was also done at two different excitation powers. You can see that the nanopores, or sorry, the nanoparticle metasurface consistently improves the stability of the emission from the phosphor compared to the other surfaces. And in general, you'll see that at higher powers, the stability enhancement is better, better uh, than at lower powers. And that's consistent with the idea that we're minimizing triplet-triplet annihilation because triplet-triplet annihilation should happen at uh, more at higher powers. So then this idea that we're shortening the lifetime should have a bigger impact at higher powers and that seems to be showing up in our data. We've clearly demonstrated improvements in the stability by coupling the phosphorus to the metasurface. However, the mechanism is still a little bit in question and we've been digging into this by taking transient photoluminescence lifetime and quantum efficiency measurements. You can see here, uh, for example, compared to glass, there is a shortening of the lifetime anytime we put the phosphor on a metal surface. That's expected because you will get some non increase in the non-radiative recombination anytime you put an, an emitter near a metal, especially within five nanometers of the metal. However, further right, we can get enhancements or reductions in the emission quantum efficiency and that will affect the lifetime. Uh, compared to planar silver, you can see that the most enhancement and shortening of enhancement in intensity and shortening of the lifetime occurs for the nanoparticle silver. That's consistent with the idea that that's also enhancing the stability the most by that mechanism that we proposed where we're uh, using an increase in the spontaneous emission rate caused by the Purcell effect. The gratings though, even though they do enhance the stability, they uh, actually increase the lifetime compared to the planar silver. So that really does not suggest that the same mechanism is causing stability enhancement for the gratings compared to the nanoparticle silver. So uh, essentially we have to dig into that data a bit more. Uh, there are probably changes in the non-radiative rate that are also affecting the stability and this should be brought about or figured out by taking uh, the quantum efficiency measurements. We also saw a size dependence of the stability for the nanoparticle metasurfaces. So again, this is 
further proof that the localized surface plasma resonances of the metasurfaces are responsible for the improvement in the stability of the phosphor on these surfaces. So taking a look at planar silver and then three different nanoparticle sizes on the metasurface for 20 nanometer diameter nanoparticles, there isn't a, as well as 150 nanometer diameter particles, there isn't a significant improvement in the stability. However, at the 80 nanometer size nanoparticle, the in intermediate one is actually the best. And that's the one that was used in the aforementioned results as well. Uh, we explain this by looking at the scattered light spectrum, spectra of the different surfaces. If you can see for the 80 nanometer case, the scattering spectrum overlaps very well with the emission spectrum of the phosphor. So clearly these two uh, resonances can couple well because there's good spectral overlap between the silver, the 80 nanometer silver nanoparticles and the emission of that phosphor. Uh, for the larger nanoparticles, the surface plasma resonance wavelength shifts to much longer wavelengths and is no longer resonant with the emission of the phosphor. And for the smaller nanoparticles, there's very little, uh, very weak localized surface plasma resonances, so they don't seem to show, uh, they don't show up uh, at all in the scattering. To summarize the two case studies I showed today, uh, we've developed a detailed understanding of fluorescent enhancement for thin film polymer semiconductors on metasurfaces. And we've developed a new approach to improving the stability of blue phosphorescent emit emitters using the local density of states of metasurfaces to increase their spontaneous emission rate. As an outlook, in general, metasurfaces have the opportunity to be used for light improving light utilization efficiency in lighting and display applications. In particular, I'm thinking about beam steering, where you would actually have a periodic or very regular, well-defined metasurface, which can be used to change or predictably modify the emission pattern of the light emitting material. As well, um, I didn't talk about this today, but many us and as well as many other research groups are looking at the application of metasurfaces to improving light management in thin films, so solar energy harvesting and photo detection applications. Uh, in general, especially when you're talking about coupling emitting materials to metasurfaces, there's a need to relate the near field interactions to the far field response. It's not always easy to predict what the cause of the emission enhancement is, and that really needs to be studied both in the near field and the far field. Finally, really to have a commercial viability for these metasurfaces, they need to be fabricated at a large scale and a low cost, probably using nano imprint lithography and roll to roll processing. And these technologies haven't been really developed enough to make this happen. So it's clearly a need for a lot of research in that area. Finally, I'd like to thank you for watching this presentation. And I'd like to acknowledge the major contributors, Zichin Shen, Catrice Carter, Kelsey Gwynn, Rama Lail, Cindy Kuma and Zhang Kai Cheng, as well as funding from the National Science Foundation and a, a user access proposal at Brookhaven National Labs. If you want further information on any of this work, you can read uh, our papers as well as visit our website at photonics.rutgers.edu. All right, well, thank you, Didra. Uh, well, uh, I saw one question through Q&A session, but uh, Didra already answered it about uh, the importance to overlap the resonance of uh, organic molecules and metasurface resonance. So if there are any other questions, you could just uh, uh, just speak it up. I mean, just uh, shut your question and uh, that will be fine. Maybe I ask a simple question. Uh, so you mentioned that quenching, oh, there is a question. Hello? 
Okay, Deidre, then uh, uh, I have a simple question. So you mentioned that uh, when the molecule is closer than five nanometers, of course, quenching occurs. How much it depends on the type of crystallinity of uh, uh, your metal? Let's say if it's single crystal silver or let's say polycrystal silver, but smooth. So um, how quenching uh, sensitive is to, to this uh, crystallinity? I think quite a lot, especially if you have, you know, excitons that are very mobile, like in, in those systems where with the polymers, you know, they're so localized that you're, you know, within five nanometers, you're going to get this happening. But for semiconductors with more mobile excitons, um, I think that that distance will change. Uh, I'm not quite certain how. Also, the orientation for the polymers as well, you know, the ones that are lying in the plane will tend to quench more than the ones that are out of plane uh, with their dipoles due to different you know, coupling mechanisms. Yeah. Good. All right, well, thank you very much again. That's indeed a uh, very nice, important uh, piece of research you presented.